Hey, before this experience begins, we just wanna pause and say thank you for watching this whenever, wherever. And our hope is not that you're just passively consuming this content, but that you are using it in your discipleship journey, that you're sharing this hope with other people. And we wanna hear stories of how God is using this in your life. And so you can drop a comment below or email me anytime online at cccomaha.org and we will help you take your best next step. Right. Well, good morning, church. Great to see all of you here this morning as we jump into phase four of our Strap Sermon Series. For those of you who have not been here for a while, we've been spending the last four weeks talking about money, and we've been targeting different people who are in different phases of their financial journey, folks who were from the I'm digging in category to digging out to people who are wealth building, and finally to folks who are leaving a legacy so today in my sermon, I'm going to be talking to people who are rich. All right, talking to people who are rich. And some of you guys like, that rules me out right away. But before you check out, let me talk a little bit about this. What I'm thinking about is I'm thinking about people who are in the leaving a legacy category. And this is probably 10 to 15% of folks at Christ Community Church. These are people who have amassed a certain amount of wealth that allows them to be able to live in retirement or live independently, and they're asking the questions of, how do I wind up living my life in my final years in such a way that I manage that money well? And my guess is that at least 10 to 15% of people who are here at Christ Community Church are in the millionaire category in the leaving a legacy phase of their lives. Now, some of you may be saying, that's not me. I am not in the millionaire category of, uh, of folks. But I think that many of you will get there by the time you retire or by the time that you die. In fact, if I think there's going to be a subset of people who just by applying biblical principles, being disciplined, and continuing to live your life in a godly way, you will accumulate more and more resources until you hit that million dollar mark. Or uh, you may be somebody who just gets lucky. You're in the right place at the right time. A business gets sold. Stocks get split. You invest in the right places. And boom, there's a blessing that comes into your life that way. Or you might be somebody who winds up getting an inheritance. Did you realize that we are the wealthiest nation in the history of the world and we are in the middle of the greatest wealth transfer in the history of the world? Estimates are that somewhere between 30 and 70 trillion dollars is going to be transferred from baby boomers to Gen X and millennials in the next 30 years. 30 to 70 trillion dollars. That's trillion with a T. And just as a reminder, a trillion is a thousand billion dollars. That's a lot of money getting transferred to the next generation. Now, I've been reading a book called Inheritolatry. And now that book estimates that the number is 60 trillion. So I'm just gonna go ahead with that book right there. 60 trillion dollars is gonna be transferred from one generation to the next generation in the next 30 years. So all that is to say, if you are not in the category of leaving a legacy or being a millionaire now, my guess is that 20 to 30% of the people who are here will be before the time you retire. Now, some of you are saying, I'm not in that category. I don't anticipate I ever will be in that category. So for you, I'm just going to say, fantasize for a few minutes. Okay, fantasize for a few minutes. Dream that perhaps you might be a millionaire. In fact, I want you all to do an exercise to get engaged here. And that is, I want you to imagine that God dropped in your lap a million dollars tomorrow. You got a million dollars put in your bank account. And God sent you a very clear message. He said, I want you to spend that million dollars on things that matter to me, things that are close to my heart, things that are gonna make a difference that I would care about if I was spending the money. Turn to the person sitting next to you and take one minute and let them know what would you do with a million dollars of God's money that he entrusted to you to spend in one year. Go ahead and turn to your neighbors. You can spend it one place, many places, whatever you want. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor, go.
Okay, you got it? You guys all, you all ready? You know how you're going to spend your million dollars? Okay, quick survey. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands for this. How many of you said, I would do something to care for the poor or the marginalized or the needy in our culture? How many said that? Good, good job, love that. How many of you had like a missions bent to it? I would try and send missionaries or reach least reached people in this world. Let's see your show of hands, beautiful, beautiful. How many of you said, I'd, I'd give a little bit to Christ Community Church? Okay, good, good, I'm glad, I'm glad. You, I love you guys, you're close to my heart, you know, it's a beautiful thing. There's lots of things that you could give to that are close to God's heart. But I want you to think about this even a little bit more. The book Inheritolatry estimates not only that 60 trillion will be transferred in America, but of that 60 trillion, five trillion dollars will be transferred through the hands of evangelical followers of Jesus in the United States of America. That's people who know God, love God, are living according to God's word and are going to be passing on their inheritances in that particular direction. Now, have you ever asked the question, when it comes to doing what Jesus told us to do, okay? So Jesus has told us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, make sure that every person on the planet knows and is able to have eternal life based on his death and resurrection. Have you ever thought about what is it gonna take in order to be able to make that happen? And what does it take in terms of people resources or vision or leadership or financial resources? Today I want to ask the financial question because we're in a money series. What would it take financially to accomplish the Great Commission? In other words, to translate the Bible into every language that it hasn't been translated into and to send 20 missionary families for 20 years to every people group on the planet and what would it take to do the technology and justice issues and leverage those things in order to be able to gain credibility for the gospel in every culture? And I did some math. I worked out some numbers. If you want to see my numbers later, you can. But the number that I came up with overall was $160 billion is what it would take. Now, that's a lot of money, $160 billion dollars. But when you look at it in comparison to the amount of wealth that's being transferred in the next 30 years, it's just a small percentage. In fact, it's only 3% of this amount right here. And if we were able to get straight in our minds how we go about doing our inheritances and our wealth transfer and to biblically prioritize the way that God has designed us to do it, we could get this job done. Are you guys tracking with me on this one? Without any like current sacrifice or pain, we could get this job done. Biblical thinking, sacrifice only at the end, prioritizing the right things. Jesus said that he wanted us to think about the way we accumulate our resources. And I think Jesus told one parable that was a parable that was designed for people who were at that legacy time of life and who are asking, if I've got some stored resources, if I've accumulated some things, what should I do with that? And it's a parable that we find in Luke chapter 12. It's about a guy who's building bigger barns. And I just, if you guys can indulge me for a minute here, every time I hear this parable being read, it reminds me of a Broadway actor by the name of Bruce Kuhn. And Bruce came to our church a number of years ago. He had memorized the entire Gospel of Luke, and he presented it in the King James Version. And when he did this particular one, he did it in a Scottish brogue that just, I feel like I have to do for you guys. Can I have permission to do that for you in this parable as I imitate Bruce Keane? Some of you might remember this. All right. A man who's accumulated some resources. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow me fruits and goods. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down me barns and build greater. And there bestow all me fruits and goods. And I will say to me, soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> but God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. 
then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Jesus is creating a cash, cautionary tale toward, tho, toward those who have wealth and saying, guys, your life could end at any particular time. Consider where you're investing your resources now in such a way that you're laying up treasure in heaven for later and don't just accumulate, accumulate, accumulate and die as the richest man in the graveyard. Now, I want to talk about the way Americans think about inheritances and the way that they take care of their money at the end of their life. And uh, in order to do that, I'm going to use a graph. And let's just go ahead and uh, say this is graph number one. And I'm just going to say this is a person who has accumulated some good wealth through their life. And it's age 65 where they retire and 95 when they die. Now, I know this is theoretical. Nobody knows when they die, but let's just say that that's the case. 95 when they die, and you kind of count how things are moving on until the time that they're 100. And let's just say that this person was particularly good at investing their resources, and uh, that they were at about $5 million by the time they hit 65. Now, the American way of thinking about this is if I got millions of dollars in the bank, I'm going to live off of that and live pretty darn well, but also hope that my money grows so that when I die, my money has doubled to $10 million and I die with more than I had when I retired. You guys following me on this one? And then the person says, okay, well, when I die, I'm going to split my money amongst my children. If they have three children, they split their money three ways, equal parts, one, two, and three, and each of their kids get $3.3 million, and that's the end of the story. Have you guys heard stories like this one? But you've probably seen it in the movies. You know, all the families gathered around the mahogany desk in the lawyer's office, and he's about to tell them exactly what their inheritance is. Well, that's the picture of the American way of going about doing inheritances. And what I want to do is I want to create three challenges to that idea today. Three different challenges that will help you to think more strategically about the use of those resources Three thoughts that'll help guide your process. Are you guys ready? Need a little response here. Are you guys ready? I knew you would be. I knew you would be. Okay, number one is this. It's all God's anyway. Now you might say, Mark, that's nothing new. You've been teaching us that for 16 years. It's true, but I want to apply it to this context, to the legacy context. Earlier we did an exercise and said, hey, if God gave you a million dollars, what would you do with that million dollars to spend it his way? And you guys had all kinds of good answers, but don't raise your hands on this one. How many of you said, I would leave a large lump sum to my kids? I'll bet it's only a few people. We need to approach the way that we use our money the same way if God dropped it in our lap in a lump sum or if it accumulated over the years. It totally changes your mind when you say this is God's money that God has given to us that we've accumulated over the years for God's sake. So let me encourage you to think with maybe here's a graph that would take you a step forward in that process, one, one step in the right direction. And that is you got $5 million at age 65, you spend money on whatever you want to, you wind up at age 95 dying and you split your money with God and your kids. And you go, okay, so here when I die, I give money towards God and the kingdom impact begins to grow when I'm at age 95. Now, this is better than the last one, which I didn't point out, which had a kingdom impact line of zero all the way through. Because if you say, I'm just going to spend on myself, grow my money, and give my money to my kids, there's no kingdom impact that happens with this. The improvement on this graph is that you say, at the end of my life, if I give, say, 25% or 50% or 80% or whatever it is towards God and split the rest between my kids, then your kingdom impact starts at the end. And the beauty of that is that there is some kingdom impact. The sadness of that is that you wait 30 years for the kingdom impact to begin when you could begin it earlier in life. Maybe you say at the end of your world, I'm gonna give a chunk to Camp Rivercrest or I'm gonna give a chunk to the Great Commission Fund and that's beautiful, but it starts working only after you die. 
Some people love the idea of thinking about saving up their money until they die because it gives them a lot of security and then leaving a large endowment to an organization. An endowment, the idea behind it is that you give them a chunk of money and they can't touch the principle of the money, but whenever it earns interest, they can use that money for the sake of what they're doing. I'll just let you know that over time, I have become not a fan of endowments. And there's two reasons why. Number one is when you give an endowment to an organization, you are giving it to them for future people to be spending. When you give it to the organization, you know who the leaders are, you know what the mission is, you know what the impact is, but that can change over time and you wind up giving your money towards something that you don't actually know where it's going to be going to. The other thing that I've found in organizations, particularly in churches, is that endowments can make leaders lazy. Endowments can make leaders lazy. It, it can make you say, hey, the money's all there, the budget's gonna be made, everything is fine. It can make givers lazy as well. Because if you're sitting there saying, hey, all of our budget needs are met by the endowment, and it doesn't matter whether I give or not, well, there's no need for faith. There's no need for sacrifice. There's no need for trusting in God. And that actually undermines the faith of the organization. So I haven't been a fan of endowments for quite a while. In fact, in Proverbs eleven twenty eight, 28, it says this, and I think this applies to individuals and organizations, those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Now, I want to encourage you that if you're in this category, if you're in the category of somebody who says, I've got some legacy uh, amount to be able to think about for the rest of my life, I want to encourage you that you need some professional help. Now, not like mental illness kind of professional health, but wealth advisors. In our Strap series, we said we are going to give a gift to each of the different groups. So if you guys remember this, for folks who are digging in, we said, hey, we're going to give you a free seminar on how to go to college debt-free. On the second piece, we have the Financial Peace University. If you're someone who's digging out or future building, Ramsey Plus is a $150 value app that anybody at Christ Community can get for free by going to uh, cccomaha.info and just downloading it with the special code that's there. But if you're somebody who's in the legacy leaving, I want you to know that we've got a seminar by our Orchard, our friends at Orchard Alliance. And what they're going to do, these are guys who are financial geeks and kingdom thinkers that say, I love to put the two ideas together of what's good for the kingdom and what's good for financial planning. They are not people who want to manage your money. They're not going to be asking you for an investment. What they're going to do is help you to think biblically and legally and financially about your resources on what's the best way to be able to put them together. So there's two seminars on August 7th. One of them is Kingdom Estate Planning. The other one is Kingdom Planned Giving. There's a dinner that's in between the two, and you can go to one or you can go to both and uh, have the dinner that's in between. Uh, but I'm going to be going to this seminar because I just can't wait to learn what these guys have to say. They will be very, very helpful. If you're someone who's interested in that seminar, you can go ahead and sign up at cccomaha.info, or if you say, you know what, I don't like signing up, up for stuff electronically, I just want to put my name on a piece of paper, you can head out to the atrium on the right side, Scott and Jim will be there with a piece of paper that you can sign up, uh, you can sign up for this seminar, plus they'll answer any questions you have. The other thing I want to encourage you to do if you're in this category is to get yourself a real live financial advisor. One financial advisor in our church told me, you are a philanthropist whether you know it or not. Either you give voluntarily to the places that you love and care about, or the government will give your money away for you. But either way, you are a philanthropist. Now, financial advisors know cool things about how to maximize your giving to your kids and to your ministries that you care about. They are concepts like trusts and donor-advised funds that pastors should not be explaining on the stage, but I want you to know that there are very cool ways that you can give more money to the things you care about and less money to the government. We've got at least a dozen good ones at Christ Community Church. You can ask around if you want to get a good reference for one. 
All right, so that's challenge number one. It's all God's anyway. Let me give you guys challenge number two. Challenge number two is this. Unequal is not unfair. Unequal is not unfair. Now, I'm not opposed to leaving money to your kids. In fact, I think it's a really good thing to do. The Bible talks about it in multiple ways that inheritances are a great thing to leave, and not just for your kids, but also for your grandkids. Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. But a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. And the Bible talks about ways that leaving an inheritance for your children is a beautiful gift that's an investment in their lives. But there's this nutty idea out there that leaving the same to every kid is the most fair thing to do. Uh, let me give you a few reasons why it might be more fair to give unequal amounts to your kids. Reason number one. Some of your kids have more kids than others of your kids might have. And if you have kids, you know that it's expensive to raise kids all along the way. So you may want to give more to them because they've had more expenses. But grandma, grandpa, you also need to confess, these are the kids that gave you grandkids. So there's that that's going for them as well. It's interesting that in Israel, when God left an inheritance to his people, in the book of Joshua, he left the land as an inheritance, he didn't give equal amounts to every tribe. He gave unequal amounts based on what is the size of the tribe. Bigger tribes got bigger land, smaller tribes got smaller land. You may want to be reflective in this, and if there's bigger tribes, you would wind up giving them more money or giving the money straight towards the grandkids, however God is leading your heart. Second reason is that some of your kids may need it more. Maybe you have one kid who's lived a sacrificial life. They've been a missionary. They've adopted kids. They've had killer medical bills along the way. So you know they just have less and they're going to need a boost. Maybe you've got another kid who's hit it rich in the business world and they really don't need the money. Weigh those things as you think about how much you're going to give. I think it's also helpful to ask, number three, it's helpful to ask, where will my kids spend the money? Where will my kids spend the money? Because you know it won't be the same for every kid. In fact, let's look at three different categories here. Category one is they might spend their money on things that are noble, right? Things that are noble, like missions or compassion. They might be adopting kids. They might be going after better education for themselves or for their kids. That's a beautiful thing. I want to give a little more money to someone who's noble. Or maybe they're, giving, they're gonna spend the money on stuff towards neutral, like they'll be reducing their debt or buying a nicer car, improving their home, going on a vacation, those kinds of things that aren't good, they're not bad, they're just neutral things you might spend money on. Or they might be spending their money on something that's nasty, nasty. Now you see my pastoral alliteration here, noble, neutral, nasty, you can tell, you know, that was written by a pastor. Anyway, uh, a nasty kid might wind up spending their money on addictions or gambling or prostitution or extravagance. And as a parent, you have to ask the question, do I want all the hard-earned money that I've been putting together for years and years to go towards these things? Maybe the answer is no. And you might bias your giving or the way that you structure it to your kids based on what is the moral character of the kids that I am taking a look at. And then finally, the fourth thing is, are they good with money? Are they good with money? Did you know that a recent study was done here in Omaha with Mark Weber of the Omaha Foundation that showed that 70% of the time, inheritance money was spent within a few years of receiving it? 70% of the time. Again, this might affect how much money you give your kids or the way that you give it to your kids. Now, some have this idea, like, I just, I have to give equal amounts to all my kids. And as I think about it, Kelly and I really never treated our kids equally. We tried to treat them fairly, but we always personalized things. For example, our daughter Casey, when she was a toddler, all we had to do was raise an eyebrow at her, and she would shape up and obey whatever we were telling her to do. But Haven? <laughs> yeah, some people up there know Haven. It was like 10 rounds in the boxing ring to try and get through to her. 
It was unequal, but it wound up being fair. Or for our kids' lessons, you know, we spent a lot of money on tennis lessons for our two older kids, but our third kid didn't want to play tennis. He wanted to play in the garage, so instead we bought tools for him for the garage. And then Haven wanted to play volleyball, and I could coach volleyball, so I personally coached her team for five years, and we didn't spend any money on lessons for her. It was unequal, but it wound up being fair because it was personalized to each kid. I would encourage you to do the same thing as you have kids, uh, to be thinking about those in particular. Proverbs 27, verse 24 says, be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Be careful to pay attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. In other words, be thoughtful and intentional about the stored resources that you have in order to help them to be able to last and have a lasting impact. All right, last challenge, last challenge. Number three is this, do your giving while you're living. Do your giving while you're living. This is my third challenge to the American way right here. Do your giving while you're living. My journey on this actually began when I was reading a book that I don't agree with. It was a book called Die With Zero, and it wasn't a Christian book, but it made me think, and sometimes the best books that you read are the books that you disagree with, but they make you think. This is the premise of the book. Your goal in accumulating money, the author says, is not to be the richest man in the graveyard. Your goal is to use it to enjoy your life and help those who you love to enjoy your life. It's this assumption of hedonism where I disagreed, but stick with me on this because some of his thoughts are helpful. His graph would look something like this. If you take a look at the graph, he would say, hey, if you got five million here, your goal is eventually at your point of death to have zero dollars that are here. And he says, for somebody who's insecure about not knowing when they're gonna die, there's ways to be able to buy insurance here so that if you outlive your money, somebody will still pay you over here. And he says, in the meantime, Why not start spending your money here in a way that leads you to a place where you can maximize the pleasure that you get from your money? So he would say, for example, why not say, hey, while I'm still healthy, I'm going to take a trip around the world and see the world. Or why not fly first class instead of flying coach? Or why not give money to your kids at this point in their life than in that point of your life? Because one of the smart things he points out is if you wind up giving your money to your kids when you're 95, how old are your kids when they get the money? They're like in their 60s, right? Right? And by then, you should be at some maximum earning place in your life. He says, if you give your money to a kid when he's in his 20s or 30s, like say $10,000, well, that's enough to really help buy a car or make a down payment for a house. It's kind of like, wow, this is amazing. But if you give them $30,000 when they're in their 60s, they're like, all right, I'll add that into my retirement account. You know, that's a nice bonus for my future. And maybe it would be smarter to give earlier rather than later. Or he says... Instead of giving your kids a bunch of money to take a really cool vacation after you die, why not take them on a vacation while you're still alive and enjoy that vacation together and other thoughts like that. So he has some interesting things, but the case of this one is still, if you wind up spending all of your money on yourself throughout all of these years, the kingdom impact that you would wind up having is zero. So it's not a Christian idea. But it made me think, What if we combine the ideas, it's all God's anyway, with the idea of die with zero? In other words, what if we decide to spend down our money over time, but we don't spend it on selfish, hedonistic things, we spend it on our family and we spend it on kingdom things over time? What you wind up with is a graph that looks more uh, like this. The money line winds up being the same and we'll say it's spending it down until you're at, say, a million dollars. Uh, when you're at 95, but instead of spending on yourself, you start spending on kingdom stuff early on. You wind up taking care of folks who are poor. You're giving money to help single moms to be able to survive. You're putting money in Camp Rivercrest and the Great Commission Fund, and as time goes by, the kingdom impact goes up. And you see these things happening. You see churches start and people get baptized and organizations built and education happens and you watch it have this upward spiral over time because you began investing back here. 
the kingdom impact winds up becoming unparalleled. In fact, in financial terms, it may be some of the most significant investment that you make in the entirety of your life in order to be able to have in impact for this world. And you're pleasing God, changing lives, and racking up treasure in heaven all at the same time. Now, I borrowed this phrase, do your given while you're living, but I don't have any idea who I borrowed it from or what the original source is. Some smart person said it, and they finished the phrase with, do your given while you're living so you're knowing where it's going. Isn't that good? So let's say it out loud together, just because it's my favorite phrase. Let's all say it together. Ready? The whole thing. Do your given while you're living so you're knowing where it's going. I think this is just a smart thing to do because you know certain places now. You know the leadership, you know the mission, you know the vision, you know how resources will be handled. And when you die, you're no longer there to be able to check those things out. Organizations and visions and leaders change, so do your given while you're living so you're knowing where it's going. I would also say it's smart to do your given while you're living to take joy in the toys. That rhymes, but it's not nearly as good as the other one, is it? So give now to your family, give now to ministry, because it's fun, because there's joy in it. You get to see the people use the stuff. You get to see ministries thrive. It's fun to watch a church go up, or be planted, or a person get baptized. There's just joy in the toys that's there. So do your giving while you're living, because there's joy in the toys. Okay, third one, enough rhyming. I think I'm done with the rhyming here. But there is one more reason on this, and that is influence, influence. You can have some influence with your giving. For example, you can give to a certain organization a little bit now, watch how they use it, and if you think that's a great way for it to be used, then boom, invest a little bit more the next year, invest a little bit more the next year. If they're not using it in wise ways, then you can go ahead and invest in different places over time. And then finally, tax advantages. There really are cool ways to be able to allocate your resources now so that more goes to what you're passionate about, towards your family, towards your ministries, and less goes to some faceless bureaucrat in Washington and whatever he or she is passionate about. Again, talk to your financial advisor about the how, but this is very real, and there's smart people out there who can help you with this. Okay, friends, I've given three big challenges this morning to the American way of thinking about leaving a legacy. And my hope is that whether you're in this category or not, I've given you some interesting things to talk with your family about over lunch today, and some interesting Bible passages to think about how does that apply in the real world. The three big challenges are, it's all God's anyway, unequal is not unfair, and do your given while you're living. I'm actually very motivated to teach this by this scripture that's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And if you're not familiar with 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy was written by the Apostle Paul, kind of a long-time church-planting missionary pastor, to his junior pastor, Timothy. And he says, Timothy, here's the ways that you are a good pastor. And his comments, he'll give some very direct instructions in his comments. One of the sets of comments he gives is, Timothy, when you're a pastor, here's the things you say to rich people. And he says this, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world. Now again, this would include everybody. Anybody who's got clean running water and clothes on their backs and shelter. We are the globally rich in this world. Command those who are rich not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Everything comes from God. Everything is to be used for God. God has provided amazing things for us, but don't place your trust in them because it's uncertain. It could go away. The only thing worth placing your trust in is God himself. Verse 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Friends, we're the only ones who will give to accomplish the Great Commission. We're the leaders in giving to care for the poor and those who are marginalized in this world. So be outrageously generous with the resources that you've been given. 
Verse 19 says, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Man, that green line that I was showing you on those graphs that you have as you head towards leaving a legacy, that green line not only represents how many people you're impacting in this world, but it also represents how much impact is coming in the coming age for you. How many treasures you've laid up in heaven in store for yourself. God has been good to provide you with things. And he expects us, you and me, to be those who manage his resources in such a way that there's impact for his kingdom. Now, as a closing thought, I want you all to remember that this all goes back to being a matter of the heart. It goes back to being yielded to God. It goes back to practices that begin early in your life. It's part of the reason why we say no matter what stage you're in in your financial journey, generosity and contentment are critical. If you can say, I can be content with what God has provided me, and I would love to erupt in generosity, whether I'm a person with few resources or more resources, it sets the pace so that no matter whether you have much or you have little, you can be fully yielded to God and making a huge impact for his kingdom. I'd love for us to remember this as I invite Ryan to come forward. I've asked him to lead us in a song at the end that's just sealing the deal of our commitment to God, that everything that we have belongs to him. Our mind, our finances, our heart, our love, our affections, everything belongs to God. And wherever you're at in your spiritual journey or your financial journey, yielding to God will take you to your next steps. Hey, thank you again for engaging with us today from wherever in the world you are at. And one of our hopes is that this ministered to you in some way. And we would love to hear about that and celebrate how God is using this content. If you would send us an email online at cccomaha.org, that would be awesome to hear your story. Or if you're on YouTube, you can just drop that in the comments so we can celebrate how God is using this in your life. We'll see you soon.